I'm Jennifer Slattery, and I know how challenging it can be when we've messed up to accept the depth of God's grace and to really comprehend his unshakable, enduring love. And I've had nights where I have replayed my failures, and I have allowed my regret and my shame to scream louder than God's grace. And if you can relate, you're going to gain great encouragement from today's guest, Max Lucado, and his book, God Never Gives Up on You, what Jacob's story teaches us about God's grace, mercy, and God's relentless love. Max, I am so glad to have you back on our podcast. You were here last September. It's great to talk to you. It really is. You do such a terrific job. I'm excited about our conversation. Yeah, it, it was a, f a fabulous book. So I'm really excited as well. So Max Lucado is a pastor. He's a speaker. He's a best-selling author who, in his own words, quote, writes books for people who don't read books. And he serves the people of Oak Hills Church in San Antonio, Texas. And his message is for the hurting, the guilty, the lonely, and the discouraged. God loves you. Let him. His books have sold more than 145 million copies in over 50 languages worldwide, and they regularly appear on bestsellers list, including the New York Times. He's the recipient of the 2021 ECPA Pinnacle Award for his outstanding contribution to the publishing industry. Max and his wife live in San Antonio, Texas, and they have three grown daughters, three sons-in-law, and two grandchildren. So you're busy. And one on the way. One oh. on the way in two weeks. Oh, two that's weeks, exciting. We're, baby, we're officially on baby watch. That's wonderful. Do you know if it's a boy or girl or is that a... It's going to be a boy. It's okay. going to be a boy. Yeah. And they live in Austin, okay. uh, which is you know, an hour, 90 minutes from us. And uh, so we're excited about that. And that's my middle daughter. And then my youngest daughter is also expecting uh, in the spring. So we're doing our best to keep the world populated. <laughs> well, that sounds that sounds like such a blessing. Well, I really loved, like I said, I loved your book. I especially love the the character. So you focus on Jacob, a man named Jacob. So for those who maybe aren't familiar with biblical history, can you give us a little, who was he? Yeah. Well, and he is such a fascinating, colorful character. So Jacob is an Old Testament character. He's best, most people under, remember Abraham. And Abraham had a son named Isaac. And Isaac had two sons, one by the name of Esau and the other by the name of Jacob. They were twins. Esau was born first and Jacob was born second, which is a big part of the story. Because in the ancient world, there were certain blessings that came with being the firstborn. And Jacob wanted those blessings. He was born holding his brother's heel, which is a triumph of irony because that's really the way he led his life. He was trying to pull people back so he could move forward. The, the beauty of Jacob's story, Jennifer, and the reason that I've, I don't know, just been attracted to it so many times through the years and finally decided it would be worth, uh, you know, preaching about. The beauty of the story is that he really wasn't that great of a guy. He, he was kind of a louse. He worked the system. He lied to his father. He swindled his brother. He, it caught up with him. He ended up marrying somebody when he thought he was marrying someone else. Maybe we'll talk about that. He negotiated with God. He, he went dark in one season and his sons went Rambo on a village. And so it was just a, he's a kind of the character Okay, let me say it like this. Some of the characters in the Bible are Mount Rushmore level. I mean, they have such faith. We want to make a put their face on a mountain. Jacob is kind of a weasel. He 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 um, he he's me. He's that guy I see when I look in the mirror. He's the guy I go bowling with or play golf with. I mean, he he wants to do right, but do right well, not always. Sometimes, seldom. And so that's why his story is so beautiful, because God used Jacob in spite of Jacob. And that's why I wanted to, you know, entitle the book, God Never Gives Up on You. I love how you said, too, that it that you see yourself in Jacob. And I think that's really encouraging for the people who feel like, okay, I'm, they probably haven't, haven't maybe done what Jacob has, right? And so that that is encouraging. In your in your discussion of his journey, you said that he he didn't show any initiative, he didn't show any resolve, he didn't show any conviction of his sin or remorse. And so why is that so important for us to recognize? <laughs> and isn't that true? 
I hope people will be enticed to read his story because he's not the only foul up in the Bible. They're all over the place. They're all over the place. David, you know, seduced Bathsheba. Peter denied Christ the night before the crucifixion. Saul was a church persecutor before he was a church builder. Paul, Saul, who became Paul. But the, here's the deal about David and Peter and Saul and Paul. They repented. You know, they they felt bad. Uh, David was so overcome with remorse, he wrote the beautiful 51st Psalm. David, Peter wept when he, you know, denied Christ. Saul became a Christian. I mean, he became a great evangelist. So show me the prayer of Jacob where he said, I'm sorry, Lord, for cheating my family. Or, or show me the acts of contrition on his part. There are a few times that he, he offers beautiful prayers. There are a few times he, he begs for mercy. But boy, it doesn't seem very often. And, and I think that, that matters because the gospel message, Jennifer, is not so much our achievement, but God's achievement. That when God makes a covenant, he will keep it. When God makes a promise, he will honor it. God made a promise to Abraham, then to Isaac, and then to Jacob that he would bless them and he would use them. We see how he did it with Abraham. We see how he did it with Isaac. And then we see how he does it even with Jacob, in spite of Jacob. So my takeaway from that is, if God will do that with Jacob, he will do it with me. Amen. Uh, I, I may have, I may try to appear like I've got it all together, but I don't, I don't. And uh, Jacob didn't either. And that's the beauty of the Jacob story. Yeah, and so what does that show us about God's heart? Yeah. Well, it shows us, number one, that his love for his children is relentless. It shows us, number two, that he is faithful to do everything he has said he would do. And that's huge. That's huge because we live in a day in which there is so much fear, so much anxiety. And I think anxiety is really a perceived loss of control when we think the world is out of control. That's when we get anxious. But as long as we believe that someone we know and love is in the cockpit, then even though we hit turbulence, we freak out less. We may still freak out some, but we freak out less. And so the, the story of Jacob is, is a good reminder that God's nature is to keep his covenants. And the covenants of God are all through the Bible. And that covenant is more in that's not to say my obedience doesn't matter. In fact, my obedience, part of the message of Jacob is he got in trouble because of his disobedience. But that is to say that God will never abandon us totally because of our disobedience. We, we obey out of love and respect for God. And as we obey, we enjoy the harvest of that obedience. Our lives are better. They're calmer. They're richer. They're fuller. I wouldn't describe Jacob's life as calm and rich and full. <laughs> it was wild and crazy and chaotic. Two wives, two handmaidens, children with each, uh, bloodthirsty sons. It was just crazy. A while. Sons that would throw one of their brothers in the pit and sell him into slavery. I mean, it was not. It was. It was the dysfunctional family in the Bible. Uh, so that Jacob's life could have been much better. It could have been. But still, God kept his promise. He allowed him to endure the consequences, but he kept his promise. And at the end of his life, Jacob was still found faithfully worshiping, worshiping God. And that's, that's, mad, that's a proof, testimony of God's faithfulness to him. Yeah. Wow. And so what would you say? So those who are listening and they're like, I am really struggling to accept God's grace, to move past, like feeling like I failed. How can... Yeah reflecting on God's character, not their sin, but on, on God's character, how can they use that as kind of a tool to bolster their faith? Yeah, what a great question. Jennifer, you always ask such great questions. Okay, so let's say let's say let's say we are talking uh, to a fella like I was just not long ago, just the kindest, most gracious guy. But about 10 years ago, he really messed up in his marriage and his wife left him he broke her heart his actions were inappropriate they were wrong 
and and he broke her heart and broke up their marriage. And uh, he uh, has a successful business. He's just the guy you'd want as your next door neighbor. He's as friendly as they come. And he beats himself up. He just beats himself up. He can't, he's stuck. He, he cannot, he cannot uh, forgive himself for what he did. That's a challenge. It is. Uh, regrets will do that to us. So uh, my, my encouragement to him was, number one, I agree with you. What you did was wrong. It's just wrong. No need to sugarcoat it. No need to downplay it. So, yeah, that was wrong. What you can do is what you've done. You confessed it. You own it. You acknowledge it. But then you got to move forward. You've got to move forward. There is there is a guilt that leads to death. Uh, and that is what, what my friend is facing. It's, it's just sucking the life out of him. It's time for him to acknowledge what he did was wrong. No, don't, don't have to pretend what he did was right. Acknowledge it. Tell it to your kids. Tell them you messed up. To your friends, tell them you messed up. It was wrong. But you know what? You can become a portrait of God's grace, a billboard of his mercy by allowing his forgiveness to motivate you to forgive yourself, to forgive yourself. And, and, and it's not an easy thing to do. But, you know, there's a difference between saying what I did is bad and who I am is bad. What I did is bad. That's guilt. Who I am is bad. That's shame. And so Jesus died to take our shame away. We're still children of God. We're still billboard. We're, we're, we're still couriers of his covenant. We're still made uh, to, to bring hope and grace into the world. And as long as we're stuck in the past, it's like the devil holds us back. So I, the, my conversation with anybody would be that, and I get that world, you know, I, I was a drunk before I was a Christian. And then after I was, became a Christian, I still struggled with temptation and continue to struggle with temptation. And, and I've learned the importance of self-forgiveness, of self-forgiveness. Again, it's not covering up. It's not pretending what you did wasn't bad, but it is trusting that God's grace is greater than our sin and allowing that grace to forgive give us and then thinking well if he can forgive me i can forgive me and so i'm moving forward amen well and hopefully as as people read the book day by day by day it's that they'll begin to really see god's grace yeah. with jacob and then it will will feel more real for them as well and on so on page 30 you wrote do not begrudge the barren stretches for in barrenness we encounter god so what, what do you mean by barren stretch first? Again, well, the context here is Jacob has just swindled his father, lied to his father, swindled his brother. And Rebecca said, you better hit the road because Esau's mad. And Jacob did. Jacob was the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham. Abraham was wealthy, so wealthy. You remember that conflict he had with Lot? There wasn't enough room for all their herds. Isaac was wealthy. And so Jacob grew up in affluence. But when he hit the road, he didn't have even a pillow. He had spent the night. He had to put his head on a pillow. It was a barren place. He did the wrong thing and he ended up in a barren place. Now, our equivalent of a barren place, what could it be? Well, you, it could be all alone because your wife moved out. It could be on a bar stool because your friends don't trust you and you're turning to alcohol to deal with your stress. It could be you're working uh, monstrously late hours because you don't want to face the challenges of life and you're hiding yourself in your work. These barren places are lifeless. They're harsh. There's not much rest. Um, they're frightening. And during those barren places, we can either run from God or we can turn to God. In the case of Jacob, God came to him. And it's that beautiful story, you all remember it well, of Jacob dreaming that a ladder had come down from heaven onto earth. And there were angels ascending and descending. And that's a picture of God reaching out to us and finding us, sending supernatural help to help us. 
when Jacob realized that God was there with him, he said, surely I, God was with me and I didn't even know it. Because in the barren place, we interpret the presence of pain as the absence of God. And so that's why this story is so important. God is telling us through Jacob's experience during those barren times, when you sit by the headstone and you cry, when you're all alone in that double bed and you, you sigh, in those times in which you feel all alone, you're not, you're not, you're not. You got to trust your faith and not trust your feelings. You may feel alone, but the fact of scripture says you're never, ever alone. So lean into that truth, lean into it, behave like God is there. I talk to him, read the Bible, I talk to people of faith. Don't cut yourself off, be kind to yourself. And you will find really that those barren places are those times in which God talks to us uh, and helps us and finds us. A story after story we know of people who in a prison or in Alcoholics Anonymous or in the loneliness of, of adultery, they really find a new fresh start in life because God met them there and they can start over. So that's my encouraging word to anybody who might be considering giving up. Please don't. God is right there and he'll help you get through this. Well, talking about difficult times in the book, so you share where Jacob wrestles with God and you shared your own painful wrestling season. Would you would you share that with us now? Do you, so about your father, do you remember? Okay. The one about my dad? Yes. Or the one about the convenience store parking lot? <laughs> well, I guess you could share whatever you feel God is leading I, you to. I, I, can, I can take them both. Why don't we do that second one? Yeah. You know, um, there is that story of Jacob wrestling with God. It's just the mystical story. It's right in there with Moses on Mount Sinai and Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jacob in the mud of Jabbok is a mystical story. By mystical, it mean, I mean, you get 10 people in a room discussing it, and you're going to have 10 different opinions about how to interpret it and what to do with it. But all all, all uh, options are good because it's in a fascinating story. Real quick, the context. Jacob by now is 20 years gone from home. He's about to re-encounter Esau for the first time. He doesn't know if Esau is going to kill him or forgive him. He sends his family across the river Jabbok. He stays to spend the night. And when he's there alone, a stranger pounces on him. We come to see this stranger is God because later he says, I've met God face to face. And all night long they wrestle. And it's a picture of the way we wrestle with God, with our doubts, our fears, with our expectations. And so finally, Jacob, I believe, at least my interpretation, seems to think he has the hand on this stranger and, and he demands to be blessed. He won't let him go until he's blessed. And God, with one finger, reaches out and touches uh, Jacob on the hip and uh, those who know these things much more than I know that the hip is is the largest muscle in the body and with one touch of the finger Jacob is brought to his knees even so Jacob being reminded of God's preeminence and strength God still blesses him changes his name from Jacob to Israel Israel meaning God fights and so it's a beautiful, beautiful picture that when we wrestle with God, God still will always have the upper hand, but he'll bless us in the midst of it. Wow. My wrestling with God moment that I tell about in this book happened, it's been nearly two decades now, Jennifer. I'm 68. I was in my late 40s, I think maybe even 50. A church was booming. I was the senior pastor of the church, and I just knew they were blessed to have me. I mean, I was a hot dog dude, you know. The church was growing. The church was nearly debt free. I was writing books. I had more deadlines that I could keep up with. I was just kind of high on myself, I can be honest. What I didn't disclose is that our church staff was really in turmoil. And bad, mean, uh, tacky emails were going back and forth. People were taking up sides one against the other. We had a staff of about 80 people, and it was just, you know, we were in camps divided. Good people were resigning because they didn't want to wow. be on that yeah. in that culture. And it was my fault. I was on the road or I was inattentive. I, I resented 
staff that wanted to talk because I was so Mr. Important, right? I had these deadlines to me. To cope with that stress, I've already acknowledged that I'm a converted drunk. But to cope with that stress, I, I just would go to a convenience store and buy the biggest beer they had and sit out in my car, in the parking lot, in my car, drinking the beer. And I did that. I won't say it was an extended period of time. I'm, I want to say it's like a two-week period. But every day I would go and, and have that beer. And it took the edge off. That's the phrase that drinkers use and I've used. Just took the edge off. Now, imagine how pitiful that was. Here's a pastor who can't be honest enough with God about his stress. And he's trying to take the edge off of that stress by going to a parking lot and sitting in his car and drinking a beer. I mean, come on, Max. Come on. You can do better than that. About that time, Christianity Today sent an editor, I mean, an art, a, a writer to our church to interview me. And she wrote an article and said, here's look, here's America's pastor. Ah, look at America's pastor. He's making a mess of his life. Uh, he, he can't help his, he can't, he can't lead his staff and he can't manage his stress. And so what happened to Jacob happened to me in that time of wrestling with my own life. Uh, God, he didn't knock my hip out of joint, but he certainly brought me to my knees. And in so much as in, in one day in particular, brought me face to face and forced me to see the kind of person I was becoming. Uh, Jennifer, I was becoming the person I was telling other people not to become, okay? I was doing, I was treating my, my pain inappropriately. And I was secretive. I wasn't telling my wife. I wasn't telling the church. It was. I was just, I, I was becoming the person that I encouraged other people not to become. And so it was a, it was a jabbock moment. And I, I was brought to my knees. But God gave me a new name. And uh, that new name is forgiven. That new name is, I'm going to learn the lesson. <laughs> that new name is, I get another chance. And it was good for me. It really was. I'm not proud of it. But you know what? It doesn't define me. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed about it, but I'm not ashamed of it. You know, I've moved on, moved on. But that that moment was a good moment for me because I realized God had never left me. Did he speak to me audibly in the parking lot? No, but I felt him talk to my heart and it woke me up. And so I went and talked to my elders, uh, told them what was going on. They prayed for me. I shared with some of the church and they prayed for me. We brought in some help to help manage the staff issue. And we finally got it sorted out and we made it through. We just got through. It was a stormy, stormy time, but we got through the turbulence passed. And so I share that story to say that, that just as God never uh, gave up on Jacob, he didn't give up on me. He, 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 he was always there. He was always there. And I hope that story encouraged his others who might assume that God has given up on them. Yeah, well, that's kind of, I also hear, hear like your ladder story too, right? Like God came to you when you were like on your, you don't have a pillow for your head, whatever. And so let's talk about those people who are in that really hard place, whether it's their own making or maybe things, life just happens and they start bargaining with God. How does that reveal, like yeah. what, what is our misunderstanding regarding God when it, mm -hmm. when we get in that response? Terrific question. Terrific question, because that's exactly what Jacob did. After that ladder came to him from heaven, this is before the wrestling in the mud story, but 20 years earlier when that ladder came from heaven and he had that image of the angels, uh, initially he was grateful and he worshiped and he thanked God, but then he offered a prayer that was so Jacob, so Jacob, because he said, if you will, then I will. If you will, uh, make sure I get home safely and be with me all my days, then I will call you God and I will give you a tenth of everything that I have. Now, number one, he didn't have anything. So I don't know why he thought he was doing, he could negotiate. And number two, he, God didn't need a pledge from him that I'll always call you God. But we do that. Uh, when God, we, we, we tend to turn God into someone with whom we can negotiate. If you will do this, God, then I will do that. Now, the, the, the danger, the jeopardy of that is that when God does not do what we want him to, 
we might lose our faith. Uh, we might say, well, I, God, I told you, if you would do this, I would do that. When you didn't do this, you must not be there. When God never agreed to that, he doesn't come to our negotiating table. He doesn't meet us at the bargaining table. He doesn't come to us with contracts. And we can't go to him with contracts. He is God and we are not. And the moment we reduce God down to someone with whom we can negotiate is the moment that we've put our faith in jeopardy because he won't he won't do what we ask him to do. And there will be there will be surprises uh, and there will be unexpected disappointments. In fact, I think that that at its core, uh, you know, disbelief is uh, unexpected consequences or in unexpected actions. Uh, we get disappointed with God. We want him to do something. And when he doesn't do it, we battle that disappointment. And those unfulfilled expectations result in a, in a faith. But think about it. It's not that we don't believe in God. It's that we don't believe in the God we've created. The God that is never makes those promises. He does guarantee there'll be turbulence. He does guarantee that he'll get us through it somehow, sometime, at some point. But he never said there won't be turbulence, turbulence and problems. So uh, the big idea is that let's let God be big. Uh, don't 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 try to reduce him down to someone with whom you can negotiate. No tit for tat, no quid pro quo. It just let God be God and we will trust in him. Reminds me of our last interview when you said where you got to a point where you decided who was going to run your life. Who would you give you who would you give permission to run your life? And I'm thinking so kind of to tie it all together back to that wrestling, right? When you have these unexpected situations and whether you turn to God or from God, you turn to God and that wrestling experience, you talk about what, after we wrestle with God, you talk about limping in God's strength. I thought that was a beautiful analogy to encapsulate your message, I think in the book, but can you just tell us what you mean by that as we close? Yeah. Yeah. The early, the, the younger Jacob had a strut to himself. The older Jacob had a limp in his gait. Uh, his faith deepened as he got older, even though his walk was weaker. Uh, Israel had a limp. Jacob had a strut. So it's the guy I told you about, you know, that I talked to who's whose marriage fell apart a decade ago. He limps. He limps. He lives with that. He does. He lives with it. But that's okay. That's okay. He limps in grace. He limps in forgiveness. The mistakes I've made in my life, I'll, I'll always have a limp from that. I'm not proud of it. But you know what? They don't define me anymore. Jacob limped. He limped home. In fact, in the Hebrews passage that refers to him, He's standing and he's holding his staff just before he dies. He dies worshiping, holding his staff. And I've wondered if that staff, he had to have it because he was about to fall over because his limp was so severe. So God left him with the reminder, a reminder that it's better to be humble and limp than it is to be proud and stride. That's a good reminder for our day because we we tend to celebrate the person who never stumbles, never falls. We make a big deal about the high and mighty. Hey, not, not, not me. I, I think I'd rather uh, find my company in the Jacobs of the world who acknowledge that we do struggle. We do stumble. But it's God's grace that keeps us, not we, that keep God's grace upon us. Well, that's a beautiful way to end. And I think for those listening, if you grab the book and bring people alongside you so you can talk through it and really work through it and, and have those truths resonate deeper in your soul. So again, his latest release is titled, God Never Gives Up on You, What Jacob's Story Teaches Us About Grace, Mercy, and God's Relentless Love. And in it, he helps readers learn to see ways that God turns our brokenness into blessings and how to overcome shame and negative thoughts by embracing who we are in the eyes of our loving and merciful God and how to strengthen our relationships by leading a life marked by grace and forgiveness for ourselves and others. And so as we read on the back cover, quote, Jacob's story invites us to believe in a God who sticks beside the unworthy and underachievers and leads us safely home. And that's so beautiful. Max, thank you so much for joining us today. 
Thank you. Thank you. All the very best. And I hope you have a terrific, terrific day. Thank you for listening. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to subscribe. Then you won't miss a single episode. We've got some great ones coming up. Share it with your friends and make sure to rate it. That encourages our team and that helps others to find it as well. Until next time, may you live as one who truly has been set free.